Today, a special edition of A Matter of Degree. The U.S. nuclear industry braces for a backlash after the crisis in Fukushima, Japan. What will it mean for the business of renewable energy? We're joined by special guest Ted Turner, the media entrepreneur, philanthropist, and self-described maverick. He's going to share his unconventional thoughts and predictions with us. Straight ahead, we explore the problems and the potential for a new green economy. I'm Sally Ranney. Thanks for joining us for a special edition of A Matter of Degree. Japan is grappling with one crisis after another. First the earthquake, and then a tsunami. Then rolling blackouts, contaminated water, all stemming from the overheated nuclear plant in Fukushima that continues to leak radiation. Ted, what does this mean for the future of renewable energy? Well, it's really hard to, hard to tell because uh, it's still an ongoing, uh, an ongoing problem. We don't know the how it's going to play out, but I would say that uh, it's a setback for, uh, for nuclear power, and uh, that should mean that it's a forward step for uh, other renewables like wind and solar and geothermal. Ted, you've often said that the next billionaires are going to come out of the renewable energy sector. Who's going to be the next billionaire? I don't know. Uh, and, and that was before we found all this uh, uh, cheap and abundant uh, natural gas that I said that. And that, does, that, it, that is a game changer. We, we really need uh, to uh, completely overhaul the, the incentives away from fossil fuels, particularly oil and, uh, oil and coal, and, and, and put those incentives uh, behind the renewables that we want to encourage, which are wind and, and solar and, and maybe geothermal. Why do you think that hasn't happened in our Congress? <laughs> Why hasn't it happened? Uh, well, I, I think the, the main reason that, that it hasn't happened is that the, uh, the forces to stay with the status quo was to stay with coal and oil are uh, ascendant right now. Uh, unfortunately. But hopefully it'll change. And do you think that uh, wind energy has, has a lot of potential, particularly on some of your properties, maybe even in South America? Uh, yes. Wherever there's wind. But you, you want to put the, uh, the wind generators in, 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 in the areas that, that, that have uh, the steadiest uh, and, and strongest winds. Let me go back to natural gas for a, for a moment. And natural gas is being called the transition fuel. How would we stage up for that as quickly as we need to? What would you do first, second, and third to make that happen? And also tell us a little bit about the natural gas exploration and development on, on one of your properties. I believe it's the Vermejo Ranch in New Mexico. Right. Well, let me start with that. We. Uh when we bought the Vermeil Ranch, uh, it, they had already uh, uh, made arrangements for uh, exploration and uh, exploitation of the uh, natural gas resources there, coal, coal seam uh, gas, and uh, it's working quite well. And it's, as I understand, it's environmental friendly. You have a closed loop system. Is this something that could be used as an example for public lands? Yes. We think so, and in fact, uh, it's El Paso is the is the, uh, is the energy company that has the rights, and we work closely with them, and uh, and and we bring a lot of people down to show them uh, to show them the uh, the way that we're we're doing it. The one thing that's really important is we re-inject the uh, water, which is somewhat contaminated in some instances, back down a mile deep in, into the ground so it won't contaminate the uh, drinking water. Now you've invested a lot in renewables and you have a solar plant also on the Vermejo Ranch. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, our, our, our majority partner there 
uh, is a southern company, and uh, we, we have 10% and they have 90. And uh, uh, we, we have a 250-acre solar installation there that will uh, power, generate the power for approximately 9,000 homes. And uh, that power is being bought by the local, uh, local co-op and electrical co-op, and they're also handling the transmission uh, of the, of the uh, energy. We're just generating it, uh, and it's working well. It's up and, up and running and has been for a couple months. Are you going to do more of these? We, we, we're, with the Southern Company, we're taking a look at uh, some other projects right now. What are you going to be doing in the future to help Congress get the message, and what needs to happen to stimulate this industry, the renewable energy industry? Well, that's a big question, but to start with the Congress, we'll, we'll continue to try and inform and, uh, and educate the congressmen and uh, the senators on, on the advantages of, uh, and, and people like Boone Pickens has done, done a, a whole lot, uh, and, and I'm, I'm here, here pushing, uh, pushing for it, so we're all we can do is uh, try and convince them. We, we have to because we can't keep uh, polluting the atmosphere without dire consequences to civilization. Several climate proposals have been uh, put forward, both to the public and to Congress. What do you think is feasible? Huh. Well, anything's feasible. But, uh, the question is, what's practical? What's going to work? It's going to take all of us working together. It's going to take government. It's going to take business. It's going to take individual people. Uh, it's going to take, take all of us to get it uh, under control in time. Thank you. Businesses care about one thing the most, the bottom line. How much money can be made in green initiatives? Can corporate America step into fill the gap? More answers and insight from Ted Turner ahead. Japan is known globally for its just-in-time manufacturing, where they deliver parts as needed instead of carrying large inventories. Some of America's favorite cars and gadgets are already feeling the pinch. Toyota says two new Prius models won't be released as planned because of production problems due to the earthquake. All 12 of its assembly plants have suspended operations due to damage or cuts to the power supply. And the iPad 2 may not reach consumers as quickly as they'd like. At least five components are made in Japan. The loss of electrical power is having a ripple effect across the economy. Electric trains can't run, and the employees can't get to work. According to Reuters, the estimated cost to the economy is upward of $300 billion. The crisis has had a nearly instantaneous impact on the price of commodities. After an early drop, corn and wheat are up, along with crude oil, natural gas, silver, and gold. Base metals are also on the rise, on the prospect of rebuilding damaged infrastructure. A survey conducted in Japan and the Middle East finds that 83% of investors plan to maintain or increase their investments in commodities over the next three years because of an expected rise in prices. Some businesses will see an economic boost from the cleanup and the reconstruction efforts in Japan. Construction firms are counting on monumental rebuilding efforts in earthquake and tsunami-affected areas. Taiheiho Cement Corporation jumped more than 5% this week, and heavy machinery maker Furukama spiked 7.5%. Ted, what other business impacts do you see on the economy because of the Japanese disaster? There will be some disruptions. There's no question about that. We can learn that... Uh, that nuclear power still got problems. I mean, I, I think a lot of us thought that it was pretty safe. Do you support nuclear power? I have. I have. Uh, I'm not real enthusiastic about it, uh, but I'd, I'd rather have a nuclear power plant or right, before this happened, but then I would a coal burning power plant because one might kill you and the other one will for sure. Thank you very much. From the fields to the table, how one species is being served up for the greater good.
Judge, you're now the second largest landowner in America. Right. Who's ahead of you? John Malone, my old buddy from Denver. And how many acres ahead is he? I don't know, just a few. I think it's like only 100,000, is that right? Well, that's a lot. <laughs> so let's go back to bison for a minute. Why bison? Well, I liked them. I, when I was a little boy, I used to, the natural world fascinated me, and I read every book I could get my hands on about animals, birds, insects, plants, the whole, the whole gamut. And uh, I was particularly uh, struck by the story of the, of the bison um, and how close they came to extinction at the hand of man uh, at, the, at the turn of the 19th century. And it, it broke my heart. We killed them down from 30 million down to uh, a couple of hundred. Wow. And almost lost them completely. And I decided if I could, when I grew up, if I could somehow make some money, I'd buy some land and I'd try and bring the bison back. And I started with three about 25 years ago, and now I've got 55,000. So we have helped to bring them back. So how many bison in total in the United States? Well, in Canada, the United States together, it's estimated that it's close to 500,000. Now, I understand that you took a mail order taxidermy course when you were a kid, and you had to kill the animals for that. And right. now, now you're trying to save them. You have the world's only privately funded endangered species fund? Yes. Is that correct? And what species are you working on? Well... The primarily ones that are uh, occur on our on our ranches, uh, things as as diverse as uh, <clears throat> desert bighorn sheep in New Mexico, and uh, Bolston tortoises uh, to the red cockaded woodpecker in uh, South Georgia and North Florida, uh, the Chiricahua leopard frog in uh, New Mexico, and uh, prairie dogs and. And the Apagato falcon, I Right, there are about on. 20 different species that we're concentrating on. Wolves. Wolves. Right, Terrific. Have you, um, have other ranchers taken your lead? Are there things that other ranchers and farmers can do? I mean, you have a lot of money and they don't. What can they do? Well, it helps to have a lot of money no matter what <laughs> you're doing. Or to have enough money to, to, to you don't need a whole lot. But uh, what what can the average person do? Yeah, the average rancher, the, farmers, well, anybody I, who owns. What I, what I do when I walk down the street, if I see a piece of trash, I'll pick it up and carry it to the nearest wastebasket. Everybody can do that. And uh, everybody can uh, volunteer some of their time to help out with uh, uh, orphan children or, you know, like a big brother or big sister program. There's, you don't have to have any money to do a lot of good. Do you see any climate changes on your properties? Absolutely. We've, uh, one of the big ones is one we were just talking about, a beetle kill of, of the pine trees. In Montana, we've lost a lot of trees, thousands of them. Well, there's millions of acres that have been affected both in uh -huh. Alaska and primarily the western, the western states. Do you have any idea about what you're going to do about this on, this is a plague that's on your properties? Well, what we've done is the trees die, we, 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 we cut them down, and that's supposed to, to help some. But as long as, uh, as the atmosphere continues to warm because of uh, excessive uh, uh, carbon uh, exhausts, then we've got a, a serious, serious problem, not just with uh, beetle kill, but all sorts of uh, environmental consequences of, uh, of the planet warming up. And, and that, with climate change. Well, we're the ones that are causing it. Thank you. It takes years to build and moments to give away your life savings. Find out how many billionaires are doing it and why, next. A new philanthropic effort to give away wealth is taking off. Dozens of the world's biggest billionaires are signing the Giving Pledge. It's a commitment to give away at least half of your wealth to, quote, make the world a better place. Fifty-four people, including everyone from Microsoft founder Bill Gates to Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, 
to Ted Turner are signing on the dotted line. Ted, you signed the giving pledge. Why did you do that? Well, I'd already, I already qualified. I'd already given, given away or made arrangements to give away over half of what I have. And why, why so passionate about giving it away? You spent years building up to making it. That's right. Well, you got to do something with it or let's let it sit. And uh, I wanted it to, to do good. How much have you given away in total? Do you know? Yeah, about a billion and a half. And one billion of that was to the UN Foundation. UN is that Foundation, correct? right, for, to help UN causes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, I've always been a big fan of the United Nations. I don't think we would have made it through the Cold War without it. And uh, so I was really distressed when the United States fell a couple of years behind in their dues. And they owed about a billion dollars to the UN and back dues and weren't paying. And the UN couldn't pay the peacekeepers, you know, that were working in Africa. So I, what I tried to do was give the billion dollars to the UN directly, but they didn't, couldn't take it at the time. They didn't have a mechanism for it. Only, only nation states could give money to the UN and their dues. So then I came up with the idea of setting up a parallel foundation that would, that would work in conjunction with the UN, and that's what the UN Foundation does. When did you start thinking about philanthropy in a major way? Uh, when I was a young man, and I thought there was a possibility I might get rich. I was, didn't have any money then, so I, you can't do much philanthropy. I did a little bit when I didn't have anything, but, uh, but as I started getting uh, wealthy, I started giving it further thought. What was I going to do with the money? You know, <laughs> When you don't have it, you want to get it, and then when you get it, you want to figure out what to do with it. What, you're involved in so many different issues. Mm -hmm. From the environment to women to diseases on the planet to climate change. Children's health. Children's health. How does that all fit together? Is there a, is there a mass, species. Is there a mastermind behind that? Well, what I'm basically trying to do is make things better for all living things. From the How butterflies do, right up to us human beings. How do you decide what to focus on? What's your focus filtering process? Focus on all process? of it. Because... I'm going to have some new bumper stickers made up that say save everything because really that's what we got to do. You can't just save the forests and not save the oceans or you can't just save the atmosphere and, and not save the, the uh, rainforest. You got to, we've got to save everything. Of everything that you've worked on in this, and you, you have founded several organizations Lots besides the UN. How, what project satis has given you the most satisfaction? Well, they, 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 the satisfaction normally comes with success, and, but with the big projects that I've been working on, we haven't had success yet. Like, one of the things I'd like to see us do real quickly is to get rid of nuclear weapons before we have a nuclear weapons accident and blow ourselves up, which we could do. I mean, this morning <laughs> it was on the news that one of the air controllers uh, at, at uh, Reagan Airport went to sleep and the planes almost ran into each other. I mean, but people do get sleepy, you know. I mean, <laughs> there's going to be mistakes that get made, and that's why we don't want to have nuclear weapons around, because you make a mistake with them, and it's all over. Yeah. You can't, the kids can't drink the water in Tokyo, for goodness sake. That's, that's terrible. What are they going to drink, Coca-Cola? And the food's tainted. Well, Coca-Cola would know, like and that. And the food's tainted. I know. What, oh, it's just terrible. We've got to be more careful with really dangerous stuff like nuclear weapons. The only safe thing to do is to get rid of them before somebody like, just think what would happen if Gaddafi had nuclear weapons now. That's what I'm working on is to try and get, get the people on our planet to, to do the things that make sense and not do the things that don't make sense. Well, philanthropy really is big business. And do you think it can drive... Uh, policy to agendas? Can it bring well, it can the world a, it together? It can help a little bit. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, the coal and oil industry are using the media and spending a lot of money to uh, tell their story, and they're doing, doing a real good job of it, you know. And, and, and in fact, they've, they've convinced uh, close to half the American people that uh, climate change isn't real. But, but I think that's, that's wrong. 
but that, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I mean, we do sometimes vote, even vote for the wrong thing. Do you think climate change, because it affects, you made the point earlier, affects all of us, do you think that's something, if it's messaged properly, could bring the world community together? Oh, absolutely. Anything can bring the world community together. One song can. Uh, a lot, uh, it, it, it doesn't take much, and that's what, that's what we need right now. We have to come together and uh, give each other a big hug and start over and start doing the smart things and stop doing the dumb things. Thank you. Coming up, success stories. Success stories abound in the green energy market. Here's a look at some of the most recent. Siemens CEO Peter Lesher tells Bloomberg he expects to grow sales of solar equipment, wind turbines, and other green products to $55 billion in the next four years. This year, he expects to generate $35 billion from its green business. America's first offshore wind project gets the go-ahead. Cape Wind's purchase agreement was approved by the National Grid and is working to secure financing. And the U.S. Department of Energy will invest up to $7 million to support early-stage solar technologies. The PV Technology Incubator Program aims to spur innovation in manufacturing processes and products in order to cut prices. With us today is forward-thinking businessman Ted Turner. What new technologies have you heard about that you're most interested in? I, I, I'm so concerned about climate change that... Uh, uh, the developments that are occurring in, in both wind and solar and geothermal to a lesser extent uh, all excite me. What specific companies or individuals do you pay attention to? Well, I, I, the, the whole thing, things are changing so, uh, so rapidly. There's so much uh, new uh, information that we're learning. I'm just trying to keep up with it. Is, is, is just trying to keep informed is a big job. How do you define success? Well, for me, uh, success is not how much money you have or how many things you've won, uh, but it's how much good you do. Success, the most successful people to me are the ones that, that do the most good. So who has influenced you the most in your life? A lot of people have. Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King. Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau. Buster Brown. How, how do you make those successes your own? Well, how did they inspire you? Jeffrey Sachs. How do I, how, how did these people inspire you? I know Jacques Cousteau was was a well, very good I, friend I of yours. I supported him and uh, helped to underwrite uh, underwrite his television programming for a number of number of years, which was a real honor to be able to do. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Oh, it was my pleasure. Yeah. And 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 and. It really didn't cost that much because there were a lot of good uh, television sponsors that wanted to, uh, to sponsor his voyages, too. So we were able to raise a lot of money. What's your greatest accomplishment in life? Well, I think uh, overall in my, in my family, it would be uh, my family turning out to be successful. All my children are worthwhile uh, contributing members to society, and none of them are in rehab or... Uh, <laughs> you know, pay, didn't pay their taxes. There's no Madoffs <laughs> that I know of. No so closet Madoffs. My family would be number one. And in, 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 my, in business, I'd have to say CNN. What have you shared with them that you would like others to know about? How did you influence With them? my family? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, we, dis we had discussions uh, over the years, uh, ever since they were little kids, about... Uh, different important issues that, uh, like the environment. Uh, and uh, I learned a lot from them, and I think maybe they learned a little from me. Mm -hmm. And are, they, are most of them involved in environmental concerns? Most of them are. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Ted, for joining us today. It was my Thank pleasure. You. A printer that doesn't need ink, plants that don't need watering, these products are proof that innovative companies make money in the marketplace by being green and convenient. Inhabitat.com shares these top products for the last year. 
The plan on print stick weighs one and a half pounds and is two inches high, two inches wide and 11 inches long. Inside, it holds 20 sheets of paper. It uses thermal technology to produce monochrome prints so there's no toner cartridge to throw away. The secret garden table holds real moss inside its green tables. The different designs reflect real landscapes from Tuscany's rolling hills to the rainforest of the Amazon. But it's all dried moss, so it requires no green thumb. We've heard from Ted Turner. Up next, I'll weigh in on what's holding America back. Radiation is leaking into the atmosphere and creeping into the water supply in Japan two weeks after the earthquake and the tsunami rocked the coast. Workers are scrambling to bring the Fukushima complex under control after the reactors overheated, leading to two explosions. Rebuilding the plant could cost as much as $235 billion, according to one estimate. Is history repeating itself? Fukushima comes on the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl. It's causing a sobering reassessment around the world on nuclear power as a dependable or safe energy source. Germany, the world's fourth largest economy, has just announced a decision to stop using nuclear energy for good. Instead, it's expanding its already impressive renewable energy system to meet demands. So what is the response in the U.S.? Nuclear energy is quickly becoming the example of a major catastrophe like the Gulf oil spill. Right now, nuclear power provides 9% of the nation's energy and 20% of our electricity. Under the Obama administration, the nuclear industry received government funding and loans. There are 104 reactors in operation in this country, and many others are planned. Instead of repeating mistakes of the past, let's change direction. Because concerns over nuclear energy are growing. This is the opportunity for our nation to invest in clean energy. What would happen if a solar panel breaks or a wind turbine fails? There is no leakage of radioactive material or gushing of oil into the ocean. These are clean, safe, money-making alternatives. But more than likely, the nuclear disaster in Japan will benefit U.S. coal companies. The easiest in-the-box solution would be to go with coal. There is an ancient Chinese saying, in crisis is opportunity. This can be an opportunity for the U.S. and the world. We can choose this moment to go outside our comfort zone of business as usual and transition to clean, safe, renewable energies. By doing that, we can compete in a new world economy, create thousands of jobs, and help us stop our reliance on foreign oil. I'm Sally Ranning. It's all a matter of degree.